Fees. Um, local authorities normally publish a fee scale. Um, however, there is still room for negotiation. Approved inspectors, by the, by the way, typically don't have published scales and they'll offer you a bespoke fee quote. Um, but what you need to find out is what service you're actually getting for that fee because that's not necessarily publicised. Um, so over to the dark side, as it's often referred to by our colleagues in um, local authorities, um, to the approved inspector system. Um, approved inspectors, hands up anyone in here who thinks that they could become an approved inspector. Okay, just you. Okay, well, welcome on board. Um, in order to become an approved inspector, you have to go through a licensing process. Okay, every local authority is by default the building control body for their area. Okay. But for an approved inspector, you have to go through an approval system. That approval system checks out whether or not you are actually competent to carry out the building control function. Okay, so you have to go through a test. Um, in addition to that test, you are also monitored on an ongoing basis. You are audited by the Construction Industry Council to see that you are maintaining your staff, your training, your up-to-date knowledge in a fit and proper manner in which to continue to practice. There is a complaints procedure, a code of conduct, and there are disciplinary um, uh, disciplinary measures that the CIC can put in place. Ultimately, they can withdraw your right to act as an approved inspector. In total, there are somewhere around 100 or so approved inspectors um, within the country. Now, they can range from effectively an individual to the largest approved inspector in the uh, UK is the NHBC, okay, who have several hundred um, staff. Um, so dealing with the approved inspector route itself, um, what you would do is you would select an approved inspector with appropriate experience and resources to handle your proposal. Now that's different from the local authority. If you're dealing with a project in Westminster, your only option effectively is to use the local authority in Westminster, okay? Whereas with an approved inspector, you can pick any one of the hundred from the list. So you can go out and you can tender your proposal to any one of those 100. Um, you'll need to negotiate the terms and conditions with your approved inspector. This includes the fee, the uh, level of service that you're looking at, etc. Okay, so it is down to you to enter into a contract there and then, and that can specify whether or not, for example, you wanted attendance at design team meetings, and that has entered then into a contractual obligation for the approved inspector to attend the design team meetings if that's what you want. When you're working with a local authority, it's far more difficult for the local authority to contract to do something. That doesn't mean to say that they won't choose to do something, it doesn't mean that they won't attend design team meetings, but what they would turn around and say is that they're not obliged to, they're not contracted to do those things. Um, what would then happen is you then give a something called an initial notice to the local authority. That's where we act together and we issue a combined document called initial notice setting out what the project actually is. So if, for example, we were building a new office block in Westminster, we would submit to them a notice that says we are proposing to deal with this new office block in Westminster, it's at this address. That sets out the fact that from that point onwards, we take over the function of the local authority. Okay, We are effectively doing exactly the same job as the local authority. The approval that you get at the end of the project is effectively exactly the same. If you're dealing with a residential scheme, um, our approval is accepted by the Council of Mortgage Lenders in exactly the same way as the local authority approval would be accepted. Um, there is a minimum of a five day period during which the local authority can check that notice, okay, to see whether or not it's an, accept it's an acceptable notice. Now things, for example, that they would be checking is, is the address that you've submitted it for actually in our local authority area? Okay, so there's a very limited number of things that they would accept or reject that notice on. They'd check, are you actually an approved inspector? So are you on that register that I mentioned earlier? Have you actually got approval to be an approved inspector? Um, once you've done that, you can then technically start on site five days later, okay? So you don't have to wait for an approval. 
I would advise that you get us on board as early as possible and not leave it until the five days beforehand, but you can work through that. Unlike the local authority system, we do not have a five to eight week prescribed period in which to approve your drawings. Okay, So you will not get an automatic approval, rejection or conditional approval at the end of that period of time. So if you haven't got together all of that list of information that I mentioned before, we won't turn around and go, you have failed to meet the standard, therefore we will reject your application and have to go through the process again. So it's not that kind of confrontational, you submit something, it's approved or rejected, it's a working together. You would still notify us at the various stages um, during the construction, we would still come out and inspect it and we'd still sign it off and complete it at the end of the day. So again, very few actual differences between the two systems. Uh, we can issue something called a plan certificate. Okay. Now a plan certificate is an approval of a particular drawing or drawings that are submitted within a scheme. So for example, if you had a set of drainage drawings and foundation drawings, you could have a plan certificate for just that element of work, effectively up to a particular level. Or you may have multiple buildings on the site and want a plan approval for one of those. The benefit of having a, um, a plan certificate is that it protects your position um, with regard to that approval. So if you have the approval in place and you build to that approval, the local authority cannot take enforcement action against you, providing you build to that drawing. Now you're not obliged to build to the drawing, as I've said, but if you choose to, you cannot have, you cannot have enforcement action taken against you because you have an approval in place. Um, in terms of site inspections, okay, which is the second phase of any approval uh, process, um, effectively both local authorities and approved inspectors offer the same service. Um, we have what we refer to as the good old fashioned statutory notifications. Um, hands up anyone here, who, has anyone ever dealt with a, a building control body at all? Has anyone, all right, okay. Anyone that's actually submitted an application to building control? Yeah. Um, when you actually start the work on site, they will normally say that you need to do a, a certain number of inspections. What is the minimum number of inspections in law that a building control body is required to carry out? Let's make it simple. Sorry? One. One. And the answer is one. And that doesn't matter what the size of the project is, the actual statutory minimum number is one inspection. I remember working for local authorities back in the probably early 1990s um, and because of the lack of staff that we had at that time, we had a policy of only doing foundation inspections, drainage inspections and completion inspections. Okay, They were the only inspections that we'd actually carry out. There's a common misconception that there are seven or more statutory inspection stages, foundations, damp, drainage. Um, roof, joists, etc. They are statutory notification stages. Okay, so they're stages where you, as the contractor, were expected to notify building control. There has never been a requirement for building control to actually come out and inspect. Okay, unless you're contracted to do it, which again is a different situation. So if you've contracted to give seven inspections and you only give five, then that's a different set of circumstances. <coughs> One of the more recent changes that have come about within building control is that the traditional seven inspection stages have generally been abandoned by all building control bodies. And instead they've adopted what we refer to as a risk-based inspection regime. So all building control bodies should still give you a list of the times when they expect to be notified, but that's bespoke to your individual project. Okay, so if, for example, you're carrying out a new complex scheme that's got some innovative material in it, but was not at one of those original stages, so it could be some new fire protection material, it could be something particularly unusual from a drainage perspective, any of those things would be something that I would probably say, I want to see that because that's new or different. 
Okay, so for example, we've dealt with some projects that have um, ICF, insulated concrete formwork. I don't know if you've come across this particular scheme, uh, which effectively is two pieces of insulation that you fill the center of with concrete. Because that is relatively unusual, we would want to be sure that the contractor is doing that correctly. So we would identify that as one of the inspection stages that we need to see. Um, site inspection records. All building control bodies are expected to keep an accurate record of your inspections that you've carried out. That's an important thing when you go uh, to look at the project in future, particularly if there are any subsequent issues or problems on it. I remember well that the original um, way in which we were taught back in the 1990s was to say as little as possible. Okay, Because if you didn't say anything on the inspection report, you couldn't be held liable for anything on the inspection report. So what would typically happen is you would say, works in progress. And literally that would be about the extent of the inspection record. Things have changed subsequently, um, much for the better I must say, and we now would expect photos to be taken. So you've got a record of the stage that you actually inspected and what it was that you inspected. And that you would have some decent notes about what you were actually inspecting and to cover what it is that your next inspection is actually due to come out and see. So for example, if you'd come out at foundation level, you'd probably say, and our next inspection will be at drains level or it will be at whatever level. Within that, it should also set out in that inspection record any defects or any areas that, that you've been asked to um, rectify. So if there are any contraventions or any changes to the approved scheme, they should be being picked up in those inspection records. And those inspection records should be made available to you. Now, you will find that building control bodies have a very, very different approach to whether or not they will release inspection records to you. So one of the things that I would suggest that you would look for is to ask as part of the appointment process whether or not you are entitled to copies of the inspection records. And the other thing that I would say that's very important is early consultation. The earlier that you get um, whichever building control body on board, the easier it is to go through the process. I've seen projects that have gone all the way through planning and have been tendered out um, and then building control has been appointed, at which point we've said, this building has one staircase too few. Okay, This building doesn't work because it's got too many stories. This building doesn't work because of the way in which it's positioned. That has been a major delay in the process. So you want to engage building control probably before or at the time that you get planning consent, okay? Don't leave it as long in the day to literally five days before you start work on site. Because if you want to get value out of building control, the way to get value out of building control is to get us on board early. We can flag up those key issues. We can flag up whether or not your site has the, the appropriate disabled access to it or not. Whether or not you have the correct number of stairs, whether or not this scheme needs sprinklers or not. Because all of those things will have a major effect on the costings and the viability of the scheme going on. And it's better to know that before you've got planning consent and tendered it than after you've got planning consent and tendered it.